Welcome to HSBC Global Viewpoint, the podcast series that brings together business leaders and industry experts to explore the latest global insights, trends, and opportunities. Make sure you're subscribed to stay up to date with new episodes. Thanks for listening, and now on to today's show. Thank you for joining this episode of HSBC Perspective Series. I'm Zoe Knight and I'm the Global Head of Sustainability Research at HSBC Global Investment Research. And I'm joined today by Ahmed al Hoshi, CEO of Fertiglobe. Fertiglobe is the world's largest seaborne exporter of urea and ammonia combined, the largest nitrogen fertilizer producer in the Middle East and North Africa, and Adnoc's low carbon ammonia platform. We're recording this on the sidelines of the GCC conference in London, and we're going to discuss low carbon solutions for the agriculture and industrial sectors. So first off, Ahmed, thank you for joining us. No, thanks for having me, Zoe. Why are you here at the GCC conference? Why is it so good for you to join? Yeah, so this isn't my first conference here. Uh, Fertiglobe has been listed since 2021 on the Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange. Uh, we found this conference to be uh, you know, a great one to be at to get the right investors. It gets a lot of attention from the very well-informed investing community, and it has a lot of our peers. I think it has uh, companies from you know the seven GCC exchanges, all in under one roof, a uh, good opportunity to cha- exchange ideas at lunch or dinners and everything like that. So it's one of the ones that we try not to miss. So tell us a little bit more about Fertiglobe and the 2030 Grow strategy and how that came about. Yeah, so Fertiglobe, um, as you said, is a large seaborne exporter of ammonia and urea. Um, what the Grow, uh, the, the Grow 2030 strategy is basically uh, something that we announced to the capital markets last month in our first investor day uh, in, in our new form. And when I say our new form is that Fertiglobe started as a joint venture between a company called OCI, which I used to be at, which is a Dutch fertilizer company and chemicals company, and Adnoc created a large uh, merged kind of North African assets of OCI, the Abu Dhabi assets of Adnoc to create this large platform. In uh, 20, uh, October 2024, uh, OCI uh, sold its stake in that joint venture to Adnoc, taking Adnoc's stake from 36% up to 86%, um, with the balance 14% listed on the ADX. What we promised to do for the market, and I actually ended up resigning from OCI to join, you know, Adnoc and Fertigo full time at that point. What we ended up, um, you know, confirming the market is that we're going to give a refresh strategy update to to the market in May of this year, which we which we did. And um, really, the key the key message there was how are we going to grow our business from you know about a six hundred and thirty million dollar EBITDA last year to you know north of a billion dollars by twenty thirty. So kind of a five to six year period, um, you know, built on four strategic pillars enabled by this new ad hoc ownership. Uh, the four strategic pillars are uh, one, uh, manufacturing and operating excellence. So, you know, really focus on costs, uh, taking advantage of the fact that we have a very young asset base uh, that has uh, significant upside in terms of asset utilization and energy efficiencies, bringing down, you know, GHG per uh, GHG emissions per ton or natural gas consumption per ton. So that alone is, the, you know, a huge part that's a lot of self-help work to add something like 165, 175 million dollars of EBITDA. The second pillar is customer proximity, which really means getting closer to that end user, disintermediating traders and intermediaries, uh, being able to generate a higher net back or higher return for our product. And that's really what Fertigobe's about. We've been really taking market share away from traders over the last few years. And we announced actually the day before our capital markets day that we've expanded downstream into Australia with a downstream acquisition, a key premium market for us, um, and a high ROIC investment, even on a cash on cash basis that we focus on. The third pillar is uh, nitrogen product expansion. What that means is that we are leaders in the nitrogen uh, fertilizer and product space. Um, where can we leverage our existing leadership in that space to get into new products? And one product we showcase at the Capital Markets Day is one that people here in the UK would be familiar with called uh, diesel exhaust fluid if they have a diesel car or AdBlue. Uh, these are, this is a kind of a wonder product that is a urea derivative uh, that you just add urea and water, it gets sprayed into the exhaust of cars and it elimin- almost eliminates nitrous oxide and particulates emissions. 
which isn't g greenhouse gas, like in our future ozone layer type emissions. It's that local emission. It's pollution. It's pollution. It? It's mm. the it's the asthma. It's the lung cancer. It's the smog. It's the local stuff, and it's the stuff that all governments care about. Even ones that don't care about the the environment, they care about their local environment a lot more than they do, uh, you know, at sometimes uh, this this GHG emission. So that's a product that we are leaning heavily into in Abu Dhabi. Um, where we're actually now, as part of ADNOC, working to change the law in Abu Dhabi to actually require its usage uh, to follow the European and U.S. markets that have been there for over a decade. Um, and also in Egypt, we're going to start producing it and exporting it into Europe as well. So um, another way where we're leveraging leadership in the urea space to get into new verticals that aren't fertilizer linked that mm -hmm. could generate a good premium over the product. And the fourth, and kind of one of the interesting ones is the, the fourth pillar is what we call disciplined low carbon ammonia growth. Discipline being the key word. And disciplined is due to the, let's say, whiplash we've seen on the ESG and sustainability side the last few years. We went from going extremely in one direction where, you know, ESG created, you know, companies trading on revenues rather than trading on cash flows or pre-revenues even, uh, to the opposite where ESG becomes actually something that could be considered a negative. And from our approach, we think ammonia, where we have leadership in that space, is a key winner in the energy transition, but it's a matter of when, not if. And we will be disciplined in our capital outlay uh, and focus on shareholder value creation as we attack, you know, go into that market. And I think there we're, we're showing about $70 million of EBITDA growth off of, 70 to $100 million of EBITDA growth off of a very low capex project we're doing in the UAE to add um, a million tons of low carbon ammonia and our Egypt Green Ammonia Project, which is a showcase project we've done with the Egyptian government where we will export green ammonia uh, into the uh, European markets where we won an award with the German government called H2 Global to, uh, to place that low carbon or green ammonia. Um, so, you know, bringing that together, that was the strategy that we shared with the market. Uh, and uh, we spent a goose amount of time go going through each of those pillars where a big part was on the manufacturing side, what we can do internally to help ourselves. Uh, and uh, we spent some time also talking about just this new life under ADNOC mm -hmm. being 86% owned versus 36% owned. And I can tell you it's night or day. I think we went from being like a, uh, you know, a late stepchild to being the actual child, right, <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. And so we, we saw um, from you know, almost overnight, we had ratings upgrades across the board by having ADNOC becoming a, a majority shareholder. Adnoc's uh, finance department has helped us refinance with all our banks, uh, reprice our debt down 60 bips, saved us, you know, in total, all that together, $10 million of interest savings without us really doing much at all. Um, and then also Adnoc has kind of recognized that as an 86% subsidiary, effectively, uh, it should consolidate all its uh, ammonia activities within us because we are global leaders in ammonia. Pre-October of last year, you know, ADNOC had its own ammonia desk and it's going to have its own ammonia traders. So now we've now consolidated that within our business, which we think, you know, is really much more powerful for us to consolidate those efforts, you know, as, and being the vehicle there. Well, that's some really impressive work and very coherent in terms of the strategy that you've put forward and the ambition that you're setting. One of the pieces of work that we've just done in terms of thinking about in how investors might view the sustainability landscape going forward is to make more of a case that the funding for transition is going to come from industries that have historically been perceived as quite high energy and quite high fossil use and and that's a shift that we're looking to see and clearly the UAE did a really great job at raising awareness of what oil and gas and others can do through the COP28 mechanism and establishing the Oil and Gas Decarbonisation Charter and the Industry Transition Alliance and all of those initiatives. And clearly having ADNOC as, uh, as, as the, now that you're front and centre in, in mind, um, it's been incredibly helpful. Um, outside of the UAE, how is the regulatory environment impacting the markets that you're serving? You talked about acquiring in Australia. Um, what, what else is there to, to think about on that front? Regulatory wise, I think being in our industry, ammonia and urea, our focus where the, a lot of the volatility in the past was really driven by commodity prices. What is European natural gas? What is oil doing? What's corn doing? All of these different elements. But there's an added kind of area of focus and complexity now, which is the regulatory side. And it can be night and day, right? You see 
um, you know, one senator in West Virginia was, you know, going to be the, you know, the do or die person for the Inflation Reduction Act, which was, you know, basically, uh, you know, signed into law in August of 2022, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then you have Trump come in the White House uh, and go in the complete other direction where we're seeing a lot of the key mechanisms and programs going in the other direction. And so you're seeing quite binary outcomes. You see a lot of um, a lot of the electorals, uh, a lot of elections in Europe also going a bit more right wing versus left wing in the past. You're seeing obviously going a bit more central in uh, in Canada. And in general, there's this 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 difference where it's going to affect how is CO2 going to be priced, right? Um, and in the ammonia, if we're going down the energy transition and we see the advantages of it, that's something we have to keep an eye on. And our focus uh, with this strategy coming out is that we cannot predict the future, right? We can't predict commodity prices and we cannot predict who's going to win the 2028 US election or what's going to happen in Europe. Um, but what we can do is try to be ready for the different scenarios in the world and be comfortable with it. So just because we've seen right wing moves in some direction and there could be delays in implementation on uh, subsidy programs or the sticks associated with CO2 pricing globally doesn't mean that we're going to put our head in the sand and wait till the next cycle because we think that would be foolish. That's the approach we took even in 2019 as Ferdy Globe's creation in my time at OCI as well is, you know, just because the EPA wasn't really focused on the environment from 2016 to 2020 in the United States didn't mean that we put our head in the sands and just ignore, you know, the opportunity to decarbonize and do all those things. So our focus needs to be that in different scenario outcomes, we should be okay from a regulatory perspective, make sure we have that license to operate long term. We know directionally where fossil fuels are going, and we see that in our case as an opportunity because ammonia doesn't have carbon in it. So ammonia is NH3. If we can make that NH3 in a low carbon way, we can driver, deliver that hydrogen when combusted without creating carbon, unlike hydrocarbons, diesel, LNG, all of these other fuels. So delivering that ammonia, that hydrogen via ammonia, we think is a mechanism. Is it economic today if there's no price for CO2? Absolutely not. But if we can keep working on making it cheaper and keep working on our value chains and being in the right place, then when that switch happens, when that marine fuel is going to eventually you know, switch and that, that new ship is going to have ammonia as a, as a fuel or from a power perspective, you're going to start using ammonia to decarbonize power in East Asia, you know, we'll be there for that. And so that's our approach. What that does also mean is that regulatory wise, we're not going to take if we will build it and they will come mentality. And that's where I think that there's a bit of that healthiness that comes with this this whiplash and kind of that's that swing back of the pendulum mm -hmm. that at least, you know, there were there are quite a few phony companies, quite frankly, out there. There's, there's a hydrogen conference every other day for the last three years. Right. And that was a great business to be in if you're doing hydrogen conferences. But at the end of the day, now when people actually have to sign and put pen to paper, you know, we we think that there's more realism or practicality in there. They're thinking, how are you going to pay for it? And we think we're very well positioned with the Abu Dhabi support, with, you know, Dr. Sultan is our chairman, who was the head of COP28. That kind of being a name brand going into the key energy consumers, those hard to bait sectors that are buying the hydrocarbons from Adnoc today, being able to offer that low carbon ammonia in the future as Fertiglobe, we think will be a big advantage. Mm. It's a really big advantage, isn't it? Having that ecosystem connectivity that Adnoc offers and hosting the COP offers in many ways of bringing, bringing consumers, potential consumers to the UAE as well as pushing the strategy out. So it's a, it's a really impressive approach. What would make you go faster? Is it a market shift or is it a corporate shift? Is, is it something that's in your control, outside of your control? We go to where the market tells us to go, right? Um, and so it sounds a bit, you know, that, that's what we end up doing, but it sounds a bit like, um, uh, maybe a bit simplistic, but we take a bit of a pragmatic approach. Today, for example, we're a five, and five plus million ton urea producer. We, if the price is high in the U.S., we'll go to the U.S. If the price is not high in the U.S., we're not going to go to the U.S., right? We will literally move those vessels in the other direction. We actually haven't been selling much urea at all into the U.S. because the U.S. has been the fastest growing buyer of Russian fertilizer in the last three years post uh, the Russia-Ukraine. So they have lower prices there. We're shifting elsewhere. When you're saying what would drive us to go into low carbon or accelerate, effectively it needs to be more carrots or more sticks or a combination thereof because there's no incentive to move. Um, 
you know, when I, previously in the prior life when I was OCI, we would have, um, we produced a low carbon methanol, a green methanol or a biomethanol. Um, we had some big methanol consumers in Europe that had lofty targets to say, we're going to reduce GHG emissions by 30% by 2030. Okay, great. Here's our low carbon methanol. Will you pay for it? Mm -hmm. And they'd say, you know, this is 2x the price of grain. It's like, yeah, but that's the cost for it. Well, we'll buy one cargo. We'll do a press release, but that's it. We're not going to do anything long term. And we don't want to do something. We, we're not going to do something unless we can pass it on to our customers because they're just going to buy Chinese later. And then I'm not going to be able to sell to that auto company in the end because I bought your low carbon product. So really, you know, there's all going to be a lot of talk until you have you know, those required, you know, energy, uh, low carbon blending into energy requirements uh, for fuels. If you're going to have, uh, you know, CO2 pricing that's there and people say now it's 70 euros a ton, I think it's going to be 100 euros a ton. There's a forward market on it, you know, those types of things. And really, the gap is big. I mean, the disadvantage of buying a low carbon ammonia, especially green, right, or, or you know, that, that big price cost for green, if you're going to buy that, it's very hard for you to compete with fossil fuels that are ubiquitous if you don't have some sort of subsidy plus some sort of stick. So I don't see anything just where we are right now. I don't see anything that's very much accelerating it. But what it has done is caused us to shift a bit more towards blue versus green, right, which is carbon capture and sequestration off of gas deriv derived hydrogen, because it is much cheaper and it's more proven technology. Green for us is a very tough one to do because it's electrolysis, which isn't proven at scale, and it's very costly. And what helped us accelerate the project in Egypt is that subsidy, that offtake from the German government, which is guaranteeing us a price for us to kind of aim at, to say if we can do it below that price, then we'll, we'll, you know, we'll go downstream and go down. So we, we as a as financial institutions need to do more at finding off-takers for you? Or? I think, and I mean, I think, and that's been the case for the last few years, but I think one, one other thing that would help would be if you're thinking as if, if, you know, governments are thinking across all, they need to kind of say, where is the lowest hanging fruit? Like, don't just go for, for example, direct air capture of CO2, which is extremely expensive for a ton of CO2. You know, if you can decarbonize an existing ammonia plant, that's going to be easier than building something in the desert. So you need to kind of look and see you know, you look at all your ways to reduce CO2 and you put them on a chart and you say, what's the cheapest way to do this? And let's focus on those and either allocate capital and or give CO2 kind of sticks and a combination thereof to get there. Mm -hmm. I think we've run out of time for our conversation today, which I'm very disappointed about because I think we could have gone on all day. Um, but it just leaves me to say thank you very much for joining us, Ahmed, and uh, I hope you have a successful conference tomorrow. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you for joining us at HSBC Global Viewpoint. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. Make sure you're subscribed to stay up to date with new episodes.